Hello, listeners. Welcome to this new episode of the podcast. How are you doing today? I hope you're doing fine out there in podcast land. I'm very happy because today I have the opportunity to talk to Matt Abrahams on my podcast. Matt is an expert in communication and he has some very helpful insights and techniques which can help us all to become better speakers. In fact, Matt has devoted much of his professional life to researching and understanding this subject, uh, spoken communication, how to communicate effectively. So he should have some very insightful things to say to us. I'm going to talk to him a little bit later today. So, listeners, do you know Matt Abrahams? Have you ever heard of him? You might have read one of his books. You might have heard his podcast. You might have seen his TEDx talk on YouTube or one of his other presentations. Here's a bit of background information about Matt so that you know who you're going to listen to and what we're going to talk about. So, um, first of all, Matt Abrahams is a lecturer in organizational behavior at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business in California. This is quite a prestigious university and uh, Matt gives lectures there on the subject of organizational behavior, which sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Organizational behavior. Is this like how people organize themselves? Well, not exactly, but it's kind of that. Uh, organizational behavior is the study of the way in which people interact with each other, the sort of interpersonal dynamics that go on between people. And so this is linked to the ways in which we interact and communicate with each other. It's related to psychology, behavioral studies, maybe a bit of linguistics. Matt is also an expert consultant in communication skills, which means that he works with private clients and helps them with their communication skills especially with presentation skills. And he's helped people to prepare for things like Nobel Prize presentations, TED Talks, World Economic Forum presentations and more. And as well as helping other people to do really good presentations, Matt is an excellent presenter himself. He's an experienced keynote speaker. His presentation about communication techniques on the Stanford Graduate School of Business YouTube channel has had over 34 million views, okay? And it's no surprise because it's an excellent video. It's an excellent presentation. A sort of masterclass in presentation skills. Is that an overstatement? Not really. You should see it. It's really good. I'll put a link in the description. So on top of all of those things, Matt has a podcast about communication, which is called Think Fast, Talk Smart. And his second book, which was recently published, is called Think Faster, Talk Smarter, How to Speak Successfully When You're Put on the Spot. Okay, and in fact, that's really what we're going to talk about in this episode. I'm going to ask Matt to give his comments, his insights and his useful advice for how to do exactly that, how to speak spontaneously when you're put on the spot. That's the idea. So let's now talk to Matt. And we're going to time travel a little bit now because I'm recording this introduction in the middle of the afternoon and I'll be talking to Matt in the evening. So let's time travel to the evening of today when no doubt the sun will have gone down a little bit because that's what happens in the evening. I'm sure you've noticed. Anyway, enough waffle from me. Let's now meet Matt and talk to him about communication techniques. Here we go. Hello, Matt. Very nice to meet you and very nice to have you on my podcast. How are you today? I am doing fantastically well, thank you. And Luke, it's great to be with you. Yeah, great. You're in California. How's California I, today? I am. We're having a we're having sort of a misty, cold morning. Not very typical for this time of year, but uh, I, I'm enjoying being hunkered down and all cozy to talk with you. Yeah, perfect. Perfect conditions. So, Matt. So, this is a podcast for learners of English. Okay. And I was just wondering, like, do you, ha- do you ever, have you ever worked with people who um, speak English uh, as a second language or a foreign language? Absolutely. All the time. And my mother taught English as a second language for about 15 to 20 years. Oh, really? So this is, yes, yes, to adults. And this is, so this is something I'm very familiar with. I would say on average, about half of my students, I teach at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, about half of my students 
uh, English is not their first language. So I am very well uh, experienced in, in working with people and being around people for whom English is not their first language. What do you find is the sort of challenge that um, they experience then with uh, communicating, you know, through speaking? Two, two challenges. Uh, one is anxiety. Most of us get nervous speaking, period. But I think those are, who are non-native speakers have an added pressure, sometimes that they put on themselves because they, they want to say it right, whatever that right is, uh, in terms of grammar, language, syntax, context, all of that. And, and so anxiety is a big, uh, a big pressure that they put on themselves. Uh, and then I think there's also just this notion of um, comfort and, and many of my non-native speakers uh, just want to be comfortable in, in their interactions. And sometimes that can be a challenge for them. I'll tell you this, my non-native speaking students tend to do better than my native speaking students routinely. And it's because they focus on their communication with an intent that native speakers don't. I'm not saying native speakers are lazy, although that might be the case in some situations. <laughs> it's just that the non-native speakers really appreciate the importance of, of their communication and they really invest a lot. And as somebody who teaches communication skills, I see the benefits of that all the time. Yeah, very interesting. Yes, of yeah. course, uh, learners of English have got that added challenge of having to control the language that they're dealing with and anxiety yes. can really sort of um, exacerbate uh, those those issues you know it can really sort of like affect people um, but yeah, yeah on, on the other hand I guess um, learners of English apply themselves so much more to communication think about it a lot more you know and strategize about it a lot more and actually that might even be an advantage in, in a way uh, as you said yeah uh Absolutely. Absolutely. Some of the best advice that I ever heard given to a non-native speaker. So I host a podcast myself and I had somebody on talking about this topic. And the best advice he said is the goal of a non-native speaker should not be to sound like a native speaker. The goal should be to just communicate their ideas. And when you take that pressure off to sound like a native speaker and just get your information across, it makes it easier for you. And yeah. I, I really appreciated that advice. And I think that advice translates in many ways. If, if we just focus on getting it done rather than doing it perfectly, that helps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so in your book, which is uh, convenient, conveniently placed on the shelf behind you there. Uh, yes. <laughs> there it is, folks. Um, so in, in your book, you, you kind of, uh, you, you talk about speaking successfully and it's it's a it's a sort of a remedy for situations when people feel very challenged by having to speak spontaneously. So, what what kind of challenges are you referring to? What are the challenges in spontaneous speaking? Yeah. So, so first, let me define what I mean by spontaneous speaking. It's the majority of the communication we do. You know, the planned presentations, the pitches, the meetings with agendas. Are, are far less frequent than the questions I'm answering, the feedback I'm giving, the small talk I'm making, the introductions I'm doing. So a lot of our communication in our personal and professional lives is spontaneous. And so the challenges are many. One, we've talked about anxiety. Two, this notion of trying to do it right. Uh, many of us see these situations as threats and challenges where I have to defend myself. Uh, so there are a lot of things that we can do to reframe these to help ourselves feel more comfortable and confident in these moments. And, and another big challenge is that that people feel like I'm just not that person. I was not born with the ability to speak well in the moment. And, and that is absolutely not true. We can all learn to be better in the moment communicators. Talking about anxiety and speaking sort of nervousness and stress, um, what happens to us? Why do we feel so stressed about public speaking? And even not even doing a presentation, just in a meeting or something when it's your turn to speak, what is it that makes us feel so uncomfortable about this kind of situation? Yeah, regardless of the language, if you're an expert in the language or not, a big thing that it, those of us who study this believe that it is hardwired into being human to be nervous when we speak in front of others. And so we are, we are addressing the biology, what biology has built into us. Mm. When we put ourselves in front of others, we are risking our reputation and our status relative to others. And that can make us very 
nervous. Now, the nice thing is, is there are things that we can do to manage that anxiety. So just because it's innate, it's part of being human, doesn't mean we can't manage it. So there are things we can do to manage both the symptoms, that's what we physically feel, that rapid heart rate, the shakiness, uh, and other things, but also the things that make us nervous in the first place, like trying to be perfect or seeing it as a threat or a challenge. So the good news is there are things we can do. The bad news is it's part of who we are, regardless of the language we're speaking in. Interestingly, people who are non-native speakers in, the, in all my work with them, some tell me that they're more nervous speaking in their native language than they are in their uh, adopted language, uh, simply because they, they put less pressure on themselves. They know it's newer so they can make more mistakes and hey, you know, it's because it's new to me, but they actually feel more nervous speaking in their native tongue. So people are all over the place when it comes to anxiety, though the reality is though that we can do things to manage it. What kind of things can we do? Yeah, it. well, so, so there we go. Uh, <laughs> so for, for many of the symptoms, the first and best thing we can do is to take some deep belly breaths, the kind of breath you would take if you've ever done Tai Chi or yoga, where you really fill your lower abdomen. Many of us, when we get nervous, our heart starts beating fast. We start breathing shallow. This is totally normal. This is your body responding to a threat. Your body is trying to oxygenate itself so it can fight or flee. And so if we take low, slow, deep breaths, we can actually reduce the heart rate and the rapid breathing so we can feel more present and calm. If you're somebody who gets shaky, that's adrenaline. Adrenaline's purpose is to move you from threat to safety. So moving in a purposeful way, not pacing back and forth or swaying side to side, but stepping towards your audience. If you're standing or gesturing more broadly, those types of movements help that adrenaline dissipate and make you look more confident. Uh, if you're like me, I perspire and blush. I don't know, Luke, what happens to you when you get nervous in front of people? I blush, as as video viewers can no doubt see, yeah. I've yeah. I've always blushed, and uh, <laughs> I've been living with this for, for years, uh, back to even the days of school. So I'd be in yeah. class, and uh, the teacher would ask me to, to uh, answer a question, and I'd just go bright red. And the worst thing about it is when I know that I'm going red, that makes it go, that makes me go even more red. So it's just totally ridiculous. So yeah, I blush. That's what happens to me. It's same thing with me. And so let me give you this technique, and you'll let me know and let your listeners know if this actually helps. The reason we're turning red and we're, pers we're perspiring, we're sweating, is because our core body temperature is going up. If you think about it, your heart's beating faster, yeah. your body is tensing up, so you're pushing more blood through tighter tubes. Your blood pressure is going up. It's just like you're exercising. You're getting hotter. And then when we get hot, we turn red and we perspire. <laughs> so we need to cool ourselves down. And the single best way to cool yourself down, yeah. believe it or not, it's going to be silly, <laughs> is to hold something cold in the palms of your hand. Okay. When you hold something cold, it cools you down. Uh, in a, on a warm, on a cold morning, have you ever held warm tea or coffee in a mug and felt it warming you up? Yes. We're just doing exactly the reverse. So by holding some, I do this all the time. Before I get nervous, getting up in front of people, I'll hold a cold bottle of water. It reduces the sweating and the blushing. I encourage you to try it, and I'm going to be very curious to hear if it helps you. I'm doing it right now, listeners. There you go. There you go. There you go. Uh, we'll see if it actually makes a difference to me right now. But uh, yeah. Okay, that's a good tip. That's a very good tip. Yeah. So we're talking about situations, listeners, right, where I suppose it might be before you have to do a presentation or any of those moments where you know that you're going to be put on the spot. Um, I mean, and and indeed while it's happening too. Um, so, yeah, you said what, moving purposefully. So if I... So before I have to do something stressful, like, for example, if I have to do a presentation or if I'm teaching some high pressure lesson or I'm doing stand up because I do that, too. I oh, get, wow. Yeah. I get very nervous before certain stand up shows. Yes. Depending on the context. Right. But I find uh, that it's, it's really a, a big deal trying to manage the, the stress and trying to stay loose. And I find that, uh, yeah, my body posture makes a huge difference. I feel like I want to kind of sit down and kind of go into a ball and look at my notes and things like that and kind of like protect myself. But I really have to try and force myself to stand up and sort of open myself up 
And I've found over the years that that really helps. Does that sort of ring true with the with what you say? Absolutely. So there, there is. Um, so you're actually highlighting a, a a contentious bit of research. Oh, really? So, uh, so I will I will share with you the results and then let you know that there these results are debated. And then the bottom line of what I'm going to say is, if it works for you, do it. Don't worry about what academics say about okay. it. Okay. So, um, for a long time, we have known that when people are big with their bodies they are seen as more confident. Nervous people make themselves smaller, they retreat. So if you take a bigger body position, a bigger body posture, you look more confident. And the easiest way to do this is to take your shoulder blades and just pull them down. Do you notice how I'm just getting broader? Mm. I'm not puffing my chest out, but if, if I just stand bigger, you will think I'm more confident. Now, the controversy comes from, there's some work that was done on power posing. That is how you hold your body in one of these big postures that said that if you do that for just a little bit, you'll begin to feel more confident. So it's not that others see you as more confident, it's you yourself begin to feel that way. Right. That research has been called into question. It's been hard to replicate. The bottom line here is if you doing something that takes a big posture makes you feel more confident, by all means do it. Let's not worry about what academic journals say about it. The point is, how you hold your body conveys meaning for others and for yourself. And as such, we should get ourselves into postures that make us feel better and more powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You talked about emphasis on perfection. This is one of the things that sort of um, causes people trouble when they are speaking spontaneously. We want to be perfect. We want to do it right. Um, how, what's a way that we can avoid putting this kind of pressure on ourselves? Yeah, so this is a big one, especially for non-native speakers. Remember I said we have to deal with symptoms and sources. So one of the sources of our anxiety is we want to do it right. And we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to do it right. Now, I am here to tell you, as somebody who's been studying communication for almost three decades, there is no right way to communicate. There are better ways and worse ways, but there is no one right way. And to put pressure on ourselves to be right actually reduces the likelihood that we will do it well at all. And I want to do a little tangent here because it's related. Many non-native speakers, when they're doing a planned presentation, will memorize because they feel like I've written it out. This is the right way to say it. I'm going to memorize it. For the same reason trying to be right, memorization doesn't help. Here's why. Your brain is like a computer. It's not a perfect analogy, but it works. You only have so much bandwidth that you can use. Think about this. If you have a laptop and you have lots of windows open or you're on your phone and you have lots of apps running, every one of those windows and apps is running a little bit less well because all of the other ones are open. So what we need to do is we need to reduce our focus on thinking about, am I saying it right? Or am I saying the words exactly as I memorize them? By dialing that down a little bit, you increase the resources you have to actually focus on what you're saying. So the way we reduce the pressure of perfection is to focus on connection. If I focus on connecting to my audience, getting my message across, not am I saying it the right way, you actually have more resources to do it better. So it's like closing down a lot of those windows and apps so that everything else performs better. So I like to tell my students, not only focus on connection, not perfection, but just strive for mediocrity. The goal is media, be mediocre, because when you take the pressure off to be great, you actually do better. So we can achieve greatness by just starting out trying to be mediocre. It sounds counterintuitive, but it works. I'm very happy to hear that because, you know, that that's very reassuring, Matt, because uh, you've just pretty much... <laughs> described my general approach, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I'm joking, right. I suppose. But um, yeah, okay. Um, what about mindset? The way we the, we think about um, situations. Uh, yeah. How does that come into it? Absolutely. So having a, a an opportunistic mindset really matters. Many of us go into these circumstances feeling like we're under threat, that this is a test. So when somebody asks me a question or asks for feedback, I'm being tested and I need to pass the test. So we get very defensive. We get very inside ourselves. When in fact, if we see these just as opportunities to connect, to learn, to collaborate, 
it changes everything. So how do we do that, right? It's one thing for me to say, just see it as an opportunity. Great, but how do I do that? So in the book, I talk about four different mindset shifts. Let me just share a couple of them, not all four, and we, unless you want. So the, the first of these is this notion that comes from Carol Dweck's work on growth mindset. She's become very famous for this approach. Growth mindset is very powerful. When we have something to learn, we can approach it as I am able to learn this information. It is possible. Or we can say to ourselves, this just isn't for me. I'm not that person. I am who I am and I can't change. The I can't change piece is a fixed mindset. The opportunity to, to grow and to expand is a growth mindset. As part of what she, her research shows, simply adopting this mantra of not yet can be very powerful. So if I'm in a communication situation that doesn't go well, rather than saying to myself, oh, I'm doomed, I'll never be good at this, I'm just not that kind of person, I say to myself, not yet. I'm just, I just haven't learned those skills. I haven't gotten that feedback. So by adopting this notion of not yet, I can learn this, it helps you have a much more positive mindset and you actually end up doing better. You know, my mother who taught ESL for, for almost two decades, she used to, her superpower in teaching ESL was not teaching the grammar and the vocabulary and all of that. It was really encouraging her students to want to learn and to take the risks and to do the repetition. So this not yet mindset can free you up to really become more present and to do better. And then the la the second one I'll share, yeah. uh, many of us fear making mistakes, yet we know that we learn through making mistakes. That's how we learn. So I like to reframe what a mistake is. To me, a mistake is just like what you see in movies and televisions when they, re when they film them. They, they do different takes. A take is simply one version of it. A, a director will ask the actors to do it this way. And then they'll do a take. They literally have that clapboard, take one. And then the director will say, okay, now do it this way, take two. Take one or take two is not wrong or, or better. They're just different. So if I, if I say something and it doesn't go the way I want, I just say to myself, take two. I'm going to say it again. So if I'm trying to explain something to you and it doesn't work, maybe I just try it again. But this time I tell a story because that might be a different take on what I'm trying to say. So if we adopt a, a mindset of not yet, I can learn this, I just haven't yet, and missed takes are just opportunities to do it again differently, then you can fundamentally feel better about what you do and ultimately get better at it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's perfect for language learning because there are just so many mistakes involved. You know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, a lot, lot of people just, uh, completely sort of phobic of making mistakes, which is natural, I suppose, but it really prevents them from getting anywhere. So you've got to embrace them, haven't you? I suppose. Uh, absolutely. Uh, at least not run away from them or, yeah. or, or beat yourself up over them. Say, oh my goodness, I'm a bad person. Mistakes are part of learning. Mm. Mistakes are, are, are helpful. In fact, um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to have this quote correct, but, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with who Yo-Yo Ma is. I see yeah. some musical instruments before. So uh, amazing, amazing cellist, right? Uh, he has this quote and I'm not going to say it right, but it goes something like this, where he says, music doesn't come alive for me until I make my first mistake. Now I want you so what's so impactful for me of this is that one, Yo-Yo Ma makes mistakes. Yeah. Two, he actually <laughs> looks for them and embraces them. And if mm. somebody who is at that that height in his career still makes mistakes and can embrace them, I can certainly make mistakes and embrace them because I am nowhere near his ability in anything in my life. So, so that just helps me. It just helps with perspective taking. Mm. That's good. That's that's great to know that. Yeah, that Yo Yo Ma makes mistakes makes us all feel a bit more human. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, what role does listening? take in in all of this because we're talking about uh, being a better speaker and stuff but is it all just about speaking no not at all listening is a critical part of it listen to be a good spontaneous speaker you have to be in the moment and you have to be responsive to what is needed and the only way to assess what's needed is to listen mm -hmm. we most of us are not good listeners uh, we, we listen just enough to get the idea of what somebody's saying and then we begin practicing and rehearsing and judging so we need to be more present. 
we need to listen for the bottom line, not the top line. So we need to be saying to ourselves, what is this person really trying to say? How would I summarize it? And then actually sometimes speaking that summary, in other words, what we call paraphrasing, can be really helpful because it, it does two things. One, it validates, I heard what you really meant. And two, it feels nice to be listened to. And when somebody paraphrases, and you do an excellent job, by the way, of paraphrasing, uh, oh, thank you. it makes you feel valid. It makes you feel good. So, so listening is critical because in listening, I understand better what you need in the moment. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, structure. I'm, I'm, by the way, listeners, I'm, I keep sort of giving um, Matt these prompts because, you know, this is I'm basically going through the contents page of his book here. <laughs> That's basically what I'm doing. Um, I mean, Matt is like the ideal guest. All I need to do is just like throw him a word and he'll just <laughs> give us the perfect answer. It's, it's fantastic. Well, but I, I, I'm not looking for the perfect answer, but uh, yeah. thank you. Um, there is... <laughs> So much that I can say about structure and for learners of a language, non-native speakers, structure is really a huge unlock. It has the potential to do a lot. So I'm going to spend a few moments on this if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So many of us, when we speak, we just list information. And this is very hard for our brains to take in. Non-native speakers suffer more from this than most people, because if I just list a whole bunch of information, that is overwhelming. Not only are all people bad at taking in lists, but taking in a list that's not in a language that's my native language is even harder. So we can help everybody, not just non-native speakers, if we package our information up in a logical way. To me, a structure is nothing more than a logical connection of ideas. Anybody who has ever watched a television advertisement has seen what I mean by a structure. Most TV advertisements follow a structure of problem, solution, benefit. They, they suggest there's some challenge or problem in the, in the world. Your dishes aren't as clean as you'd like them. Um, you're, 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 not, uh, you're not as healthy as you'd like to be. These are problems. They then offer products and services that fix those problems, and then they share with you or tell you the benefit. That's a structure, problem, solution, benefit. Mm. What a structure does is it helps the person hearing it to digest it because it's packaged nicely and logically, and our brains are wired for that. And it helps me as the communicator to prioritize what I'm saying in a way that will make it easier for you. So there are many structures that exist that can help us to communicate more effectively. I'll give you my favorite. And this one I like because you can use it in so many ways. It is three simple questions. What, so what, now what? What is the information that you're sharing? It could be your update if you're at a meeting and you're updating people. It could be your feedback if somebody's asked you for feedback. It could be your answer if somebody's asked you a question. The so what is why is it important to the people you're talking to? And the now what is what comes next afterwards? So just by answering those questions, what, so what, now what, you package your information up and make it easy for others to use. Now, I'm going to take a quick time out, Luke. I just used what, so what, now what to answer your question about a structure. I told you what structures were, why they're important, and I gave you examples of ones you can use. That's what, so what, now what in use. So if your listeners said, hey, Matt's answer sounded really packaged well, I understood it, that's because I simply put it in a structure. So what, can people kind of, yeah, take this structure when they are in various situations, right? They can kind of prepare themselves or just at least think in these terms uh, for presentations or those moments in meetings when you have to do something or any situation where you've got to just share information. Does it, I guess, does it become a habit, do you think, the way if people do it again and again? Does it just sort of like slot into a, a sort of a habit of behavior? Yes, absolutely. And, and that's exactly how you get better at it. You have to practice. Mm. Um, just like an athlete, just like a musician, the only way you get good at it is by practicing it. And then when you practice it, it becomes very natural. So if you want to learn the structure I just shared, what, so what, now what, here's what I challenge you to do. When you are done listening to Luke's podcast or my podcast or whatever, I want you to stop and I want you to say, what was that about? 
Why is it important to me and what can I do with that information? In other words, just ask yourself, what, so what, now what? We know from research that by doing this little bit of reflection, you will remember the content better. We remember content better that we think about and question after the fact. The other thing you're doing is you're drilling the structure so it becomes more natural for you. So if you do this for a week after you read things or listen to things a couple times a day, all of a sudden this structure becomes very natural for you. So I encourage everybody listening to just practice this and you'll see the benefits of doing it. Right. Like, What did I just hear? Why is that important? What can I do with it next? More or less. Exactly or right. What? So what? Now what? That's right. Great. Um, there's like a million things I could ask you, Matt. Um, <laughs> you know, while I was preparing for this interview, uh, I sort of, you know, checked out some of your presentations on YouTube. You've got, yeah. you've got one, uh, which is on the, um, Stanford Graduate School of Business, uh, YouTube channel. It's got, do you know how many views it's got? It has a lot. It has a lot. I have, I've lost count, but it's got a few million. It's about 34 million at this moment. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yes. And do you know what the top comment is under the video? I don't. I haven't looked at it in a long okay, time. I've got, to, I've got to read it out to you. I can't remember it verbatim, but let me yes. just try and find it. Oh, hold on. Just bear with me a second. Okay. So here's, here's one of the top comments, 21,000 likes. It says, he never uses um, well, ah, uh, hmm for 50 minutes. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> right. That's really interesting. Yeah. And there are 279 replies to that. The first reply says, "Yes, he did. Check it out. 16 minutes and six seconds." <laughs> and I, I checked 16 minutes and six seconds, and this is what happened. The uh, creative arts department. Literally a microsecond of the uh, creative department just between two words. <laughs> so I found that <laughs> to be quite funny. <laughs> So, so what I find fascinating is that people actually, <laughs> that, that many people actually looked at it. Anyway, that's interesting. Well, I mean, it's true. Uh, how do you manage to do that? Because that's a, that's a thing that lots of people have in their first language, second language, whichever, whichever language it is, little fillers and things like that. Have you, have you always just been able to kind of speak so fluently without uh, oh. those little sounds? And why do we make those sounds anyway? Yes. So lots of questions there. So the answer to your first question is no, I've not, I, I've not always been able to do that, nor do I always never say them. You will hear me say ums and us probably as part of this that we're doing. Mm -hmm. We say them for, so I, I interviewed somebody who is a neuro linguist. Her name is Valerie Friedland, fascinating person. Uh, and, and see, I just did one. Yeah. She helped me understand that these serve a purpose when parents are teaching children language, they will often use some filler, and it depends on cultures, different cultures have different fillers. So for example, in the United States, we tend to say uh or um, in Asian cultures, they will often say ah uh, or oh, but they're filling the same purpose. It's just the sound is different. Yeah. We will, you alert a young child that what's about to come is a new word or something you should pay attention to. So when I say, um, and then I say something new to a child, they are trained that when I hear the, um, I should pay a special attention to it. So it serves a purpose. It also as adults serves a purpose to hold the floor. So if I'm done speaking, but I want to say something else, if I pause, you might think I'm done. So you start, but if I stop speaking and go, um, you know, it's, uh, st I still want to speak. So ums and ahs actually fill purposes. The problem is when they get distracting. So the goal is not eliminating them all. In fact, people who write screenplays for televisions and movies put filler words in because they learn that if they don't, all the, it doesn't sound real. It sounds, it sounds fake. So again, the goal is not eliminating these. The goal is to reduce them so they're not distracting. And the first and best way to do this is just to become aware. You can't change something you don't know you're doing. So how do we become aware? Well, you can record yourself and listen. You can ask others to inform you. You can actually buy apps. There are apps for your phone that will actually keep track of the number of ums and uhs that you say. So it actually uh, law, it, it actually keeps track and will buzz or beep every time you say one. So there are mm. tools that can build some awareness. 
So we just need to be aware of doing it and then we can begin to change it. Okay, very interesting. Another question yes. for you about uh, the future of communication. Um, mm. Do you think that the way that we communicate with each other is going to change? Um, I mean, obviously it has changed a lot over the last, whatever it is, 20, 30 years since the internet got involved and we started doing things like this, talking right. through you know platforms like Zoom or other, other software. Um, and that's obviously changed the way we communicate quite a lot. But what about the future, Matt? Do you, do you, do you see any sort of uh, things on the horizon? Yeah, so, so technology is absolutely going to impact and change the way that we communicate. It already has. Uh, the biggest change that I think is, is uh, starting now, I mean, it's started a little bit ago, is the notion of generative AI, things like chat GPT and others. Uh, this is fundamentally changing how we communicate, how we craft what we say. I am an optimist in terms of in general, and so I think that this will bring to us some interesting uh, and useful uh, tools that we can use. I am concerned. I'm concerned about the truthfulness of what's there. I'm, uh, you know, how we can manipulate some of the things. But I do think, for example, for a non-native speaker, generative AI can be really helpful. And I see this with my students where they will write something or prepare an outline or have a structure and then they'll run it through chat GPT, not to see what's the right way, but just to, to get help with some of the grammar or diction or to give them different ideas and approaches to how they can use it or how they can say what they want to say. Mm -hmm. I also encourage my students to use it, for example, before they have a Q and A session in my class, Go to a generative AI, say, I'm giving a presentation on this. What are three or four questions I might get? And then practice answering the questions, not to memorize the answers, but just to get some of those repetitions. So communication is ever changing. Technology is, is highly involved in it. And we need to be thinking about ways uh, to address and adjust it to our communication to it so we can actually take the benefit and avoid some of the, the negative consequences. Have you ever had a conversation with chat gpt or something similar and how did it go yeah so on my podcast when chat gpt first started coming out we knew we wanted to do an episode on it and we were talking and, and all of a sudden we just said hey why don't we just interview it and this is before it had its own voice generated thing yeah so we would type in prompts and then we would get its output and run it through a text to voice thing and it was a fascinating conversation uh, one of the questions I asked is, will you replace the need for human communication? And it came back unequivocally and said, no, the thing that humans have that that I is, is ChatGPT speaking don't is the ability to connect. Humans have this ability to connect and feel a sense of belonging that technology does not and perhaps never will, and maybe hopefully never will, mm. the ability to connect in that way. And I found that very insightful and actually very reassuring. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, final thing. So going back to your presentations, and, you know, I'm, I'm flattering you again by saying how, how good they are. But um, we talked about learning from failure. I'm just wondering if, like, back in the day, if you've ever had any failures, have you ever had sort of like a presentation that went horribly wrong or something like that? Because, you know, again, Routine. as a, as a stand-up comedian, I love uh, the stories of when people have a terrible time in front of an audience, you know, like uh, all comedians have got stories of, of that. And it's quite often quite interesting to, to listen to them. But anyway, have you ever sort of had a horrible presentation or something that went wrong? All the time. Luke, all yeah. the time, right? Yeah. Uh, there, there is, yes, things go wrong all the time. I misspeak, I say the wrong thing, I misunderstand, I answer a question I thought was asked when it really wasn't. This, this happens to me quite frequently. It happens to many people, but I try to see them as opportunities to learn. I try to adjust and adapt. They are fewer and farther between than they used to be. But uh, we are all, we, we all make mistakes. We all have, have struggles. The, the challenge is to, to just persist and to reflect and learn from them. You know, at the end of every day, I spend a minute thinking about one or two things that went well in my communication during the day and one or two things I'd like to strengthen. And I actually document them. And at the end of every week on Sundays, I'll go back and look for the course of the whole week and I'll say, OK, this coming week, I'm going to really try to work on this. So I'm looking for patterns. So it is through 
committed, dedicated work on improving that I do think I've gotten better, but it doesn't mean I'm still not making mistakes and issues. Mm. Very interesting, Matt. Very encouraging as well. And um, also sort of reassuring in many ways. And I think that uh, I hope and believe my audience will really enjoy listening to you. Um, Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Just remind uh, everyone again, uh, if they want to find out more about the things you have to say, uh, what should they do? Excellent. So I can be found most easily at mattabrahams.com. I have a whole bunch of resources there. I host a podcast, Think Fast, Talk Smart. For every episode, we release English language learning content. We take a noun, a verb, a descriptor, and one idiom for every episode. So if you're a non-native speaker, you can go check that out on a site called fastersmarter.io. You listen to the episode, then you go find this, and hopefully it will help. So there are lots of things that that I hope I'm doing to help people who are learning English and to help people communicate better in general. Fantastic. Okay. Well, brilliant. I'll let you get back to your uh, misty Californian morning. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) And it was really, really nice to speak to you. Thank you so much. Luke, it was a true pleasure. Keep up the work you're doing. It's very helpful. Thanks very much. I will. Okay, well, have a lovely day. You as well. Thank you. Okay, so that was my conversation with Matt Abrahams. And I want to say thanks again to Matt for taking the time to do that episode with me. Very nice to talk to him. And so it's the next day now, right? The next day after I recorded that. And I've just uh, been through the episode, edited it together, put the video stuff together, you know, edited the video and audio and stuff like that. Audio sounds great. Video looks good, except my my bright red face. (laughs) Uh, If if you've been watching the video, you probably, I don't know, you probably noticed that. I shouldn't make a big deal out of it because it doesn't doesn't matter at all. But I couldn't help noticing that as I was editing it. It's like, oh my God, I I just went bright red during that conversation. (laughs) We talked about it a bit, of course, you know, and that's kind of like all part of what this was about right this episode was about that uh these sorts of responses um to all sorts of situations speaking situations it's just totally normal and human and natural to uh uh, have certain responses maybe i felt a little bit nervous during that conversation i mean i shouldn't i didn't really want to or didn't even think it was necessary but maybe i just thought that uh i don't know what it was but Clearly, I just felt some some level of anxiety, which um, turned into my face sort of glowing up like a beacon. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I might talk about that a bit later, about things like blushing and other responses we have to little bits of social anxiety. Not that, not that Matt gave me any reason to be anxious. He was a very uh, warm, very relaxed and very personable guest. And it was a pleasure to talk to him. Now, what I thought I would do here at the end of the episode is just kind of reflect on some of the things that Matt said and maybe just kind of um, summarize some of those things because there was a lot of really, really good, useful advice in there, right? Um, Lots of stuff, in fact, that he talked about. Uh, You know, we went through certain points, like, for example, um, what what were the basic points that we went through? Um, anxiety in speaking, right? Nervousness, stress. Um, uh, we feel anxious when we are put on the spot and we have to speak spontaneously. This could be in situations where we have to talk to a room full of people doing a presentation or when you're in a meeting and the boss asks you to, for, to give your opinion or you find yourself in a lift with some of your managers or something and you have to kind of make a bit of small talk or many other different situations that we can just feel a lot of anxiety and uh, Matt talked about how this is a normal human response um, he mentioned the fight the the fight or flight mechanism have you heard of this before fight or flight it's a sort of normal human response to moments of stress or moments that we perceive to be stressful or maybe threatening and the idea that if we um, talk in front of everyone that we will expose ourselves and we feel naturally quite threatened by this and the body has a natural response which is to go into the fight or flight mechanism basically your body's like right come on then get ready to fight 
get ready to defend yourself. And flight means running away, okay? Uh, f to fly, I mean, not literally fly with wings, it's just another way of saying run away. Um, like when Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, because um, of course everyone, you're all familiar with the, with the entire uh, script of the Lord of the Rings films, when he's just been, uh, <laughs> when he's about to fall into that chasm because of the big Balrog, he turns to them. He's like hanging onto the cliff and he says, fly, you fools, meaning run away. Okay, random Lord of the Rings reference. What happened? I don't know. Some of you will be like, yeah, right, got it. Anyway, fight or flight. So you, basically your body's like, right, get ready for a fight or get ready to run away. One or, t one or the other. It's a survival thing, isn't it? And so you, your body gets flooded with adrenaline. Your heart starts beating faster. And other things happen, like you can get sweaty palms, you know, the palms of your hands. Um, you can get um, uh, other things. You, uh, what else happens? You start to get hot. You might go red in the face because of all the blood pumping through your system. Um, you might get a lot of nervous energy those sorts of things. So those are natural responses. And so um, Matt talked about the importance of doing things like using breathing and breathing in the right way and considering your posture and doing things like holding on to a cold bottle of water because it can help to reduce your body temperature. Little tricks like that, which can help you manage your anxiety. Preparation also helps a bit. Which, which to manage your anxiety. He talked about our emphasis on perfection, the fact that we all we all impose this pressure on ourselves to be perfect. We want everything to be done perfectly, okay? But uh, this is not always the uh, most useful thing that we can do. Why do we put so much pressure on ourselves? How can we avoid putting so much pressure on ourselves? And Matt advises accepting imperfections or mistakes and focusing instead of focusing on being perfect focusing on making genuine meaningful human connections so this is basically connection not perfection where have we heard that before of course we've heard that from all ears english this is their mantra and it's true we need to try and remember that don't worry too much about being perfect all the time instead focus on making a human connection now you might think to yourself but luke i'm learning english i want to be able to do it correctly which is of course absolutely fair and you know it's a it's a reasonable thing to do you know you study english you study the the grammar and the vocabulary and the pronunciation and stuff like that so that you can speak and use the language in the way that it's supposed to be used without making glaring errors or without you know without without making a bad impression or without being uh, incoherent right but you've got to keep these things in balance it's good to work on your accuracy and work on your grammatical and phonological accuracy and and to practice to get that level of control over English, the syntax, the lexis, the phonology, all of that stuff. It's good to practice and improve your ability to do all those things as much as possible. But then when you're in a real world situation, you do also have to learn to kind of put that stuff away you know, and try not to let that blind you or try not to let that affect you too much. And you have to, I guess you have to think to yourself, right, I've done my homework. I've done my preparation. I've done all my control practice. I've studied the, the grammar and stuff, but now I need to actually, I need to focus on actually communicating with these people or with this person and making a connection with them. So I've got to try and put the grammar to one side now and trust and hope that the control practice I've done is going to pay off now. But but we shouldn't be um, overly uh, distracted by a sort of desire to be perfect uh, in the language that we're using, um, right? Instead, we should try to focus on making connections with the people we're talking to, uh, because ultimately this is the most important thing. Um, Matt talked about mindset. So just our attitude, the way we think about speaking situations, 
And uh, many of us view speaking situations as very uh, high stakes, right? High stakes. So uh, you, you stand to, to win or lose a huge amount, like your whole um, reputation is on the line or something like that, that we put tremendous value uh, on these situations. And as a result, you know, the anxiety levels start to, to go up. So how can we actually change the way we think about these things? Well, Matt encourages us, us to shift our mindset shift the way that we see these things completely. And instead of seeing these things as like high risk situations or big challenges, we should see them as sort of like opportunities, really. Opportunities to share ideas with people, to connect with others, rather than seeing them as a performance. That's a really good bit of advice. And, you know, I have to think about these things. We all have to think about these things. Matt, thinks about these things and uses these techniques himself. And he's been doing this for decades, which is probably one of the reasons why he is so good at what he does, right? Uh, he certainly kind of practices what he preaches, meaning that he uses all these techniques and has applied all of this advice and knowledge to himself. And the results are that he is very sort of uh, um, clear and um, engaging and warm and um, pleasant to listen to and informative and useful and he gets straight to the point you know he's a very effective communicator so I have to think about these things too that sometimes for example if I'm talking to a classroom of people or if I'm doing this if I'm talking to a camera on my own in my room and thinking to myself right the stuff that's being recorded right now on this device in front of me this is going to be converted into a thing that will go online that tens of thousands of people are going to watch right and you start to get into that mindset of feeling judged you know you become aware that people are going to be judging me and what are they going to say about me and does you know uh, what about the way I look today and what are people going to say? You know, you start to get caught in that kind of cycle of thinking. But instead of seeing this as a performance, I have to remember what I'm doing, which is that I'm communicating these ideas to you. And that's got to be the primary thought in my mind. That's my primary motivation is to get across my ideas and focus on sharing ideas with you and forget about the, the idea of this being a performance. Okay. Um, Matt also talked about the idea of mistakes and he called them missed takes instead as if it's like you're making a film and you do one version and the director says okay let's try that again take two and you get a chance to do it again in a slightly different way that we should see mistakes as opportunities to try it again to improve to do it differently and this of course as we know relates to, to language learning because we have to try and see mistakes as being uh, opportunities to learn, opportunities to try it again and get it better. And no one ever got anything right first time, you know? Uh, so you can't really expect to just, uh, I mean, the classic, the classic mistake where people study English, study, 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 until they feel like, right, now I'm ready to actually use the language, and then they expect themselves to just use it flawlessly. Doesn't like that, doesn't work like that. You have to you have to make loads of mistakes first and learn from them and see them as chances rather than see them as these terrible things that you have to avoid because if you make a mistake, you'll lose face. Uh, not really. It's, it's never really as bad as that. Um, listening. Uh, Matt talked about the importance of listening. Um, is this all about just being a better speaker. Sometimes in communication, we focus too much on ourselves and uh, our productive speaking, right? But actually, a successful interaction is largely about listening. And we do a lot more listening than we do speaking, in fact. So we've got to remember the value of listening. This is crucial. Effective communication involves active listening, and understanding others and active listening really relates to really trying to pay attention not just to the words that someone is saying but the intention behind those words where are they really coming from what are they really trying to say what is the bottom line that's what matt says what's the bottom line of what this person is saying so the bottom line this idea comes from the idea of the the balance sheet 
in accounting, right, in business. You've got a profit and loss account and um, basically the bottom line refers to the profit that is made uh, by a company after all its business has been done. And the bottom line is ultimately the most important thing for a business to consider, yes? So this is the bottom line. But also the bottom line now has sort of become an idiom to mean the ultimate sort of main, most important factor. So um, we have to just think about what's the bottom line of what this person is saying. What's the real intention or feeling behind these words? What does someone really want? Is this person looking for a solution? Are they looking for my advice? Or do they want my um, my sympathy? Do they want to be reassured? You know? Um, so it's really about paying attention, not just to the things that people are saying, but the intention behind what they're saying. And active listening also is, a, is about um, showing the other person that you're listening. So it's no good actually, it's it's, that you've got to perform the thing that you're doing as well. I mean, I've said it's not a performance, but hmm, how can I put this? So if you're listening to someone and you're really paying attention, that's fine, okay? But you, that other person has to know that you're listening as well. And this is where you use your body language. You've got to really sort of like lean in, uh, pay attention to the person, make eye contact with them. Obviously, there's cultural things related to eye contact but in any case you've got to show that person that you're listening that person has to be really aware that you're listening and you do that by you know telling them in non-verbal ways that you're listening so you you know you you make eye contact as much as it's uh, appropriate you nod your head uh, you you know you, you make all the right body language and then you uh, respond to the things they've said paraphrasing for example, repeating back to them the, 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 the point that they've just made. Um, so that's the importance of listening. And then Matt also talked about structure. And this doesn't mean grammatical structure, but just sort of like structuring our behaviour when we communicate. And using certain structures can really help us to, I guess, break through that slightly chaotic feeling which can happen when we get into that anxious state, right, of, uh, oh God, what am I gonna say? Oh, I'm gonna say it wrong. Breaking through that with a kind of dependable, simple, easy to follow structure that you use every time, right? Um, on when you have to deliver information. And Matt's favorite one was what, so what, now what? Okay, uh, what, so what, now what? So the what is basically what, what was that about? And in and I'll I'll do a what so what now what in a moment, but what meaning what is this about or what is, what was that about? So what means why is it important? And now what is basically what can I what can you do what can we do what can I do with that information? So what is it? Why is it important? What can we do with it? Okay. So essentially, what so what now what the what is that that was Matt Abrahams. Um, a an expert in communication, telling us about uh, ways in which we can become better communicators, especially in spontaneous speaking situations. Um, this is obviously important for everyone. I mean, it's clear, isn't it? He's really nailed it. He's really nailed this very important thing that affects all of us. It's obvious why it's important to us, because we all uh, have to deal with these situations and we care a lot about them. And now what What can you do with this information? Well, um, you can go and try and apply some of those ideas. You can actually try and apply them um, in your first language, but also in situations when you use English. And by, I guess, breaking through some of that anxiety, uh, changing your mindset into a more positive, growth-oriented mindset, when you speak English, you can give yourself a chance. You know, you can kind of... Um, create conditions for yourself in which you are able to give your English a chance and allow all the work you've done already to kind of shine through, okay? Um, I wanted to talk about blushing because it happened to me. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, I think what one of the things that happened there is that it was the evening, okay, and um, I had 
kind of been running around all evening. I've gone to pick up my son and then been stressing out, trying to get the dinner ready. Everything sort of had to happen all at the right time. And then I rushed over here to get ready for the interview. And then during the interview, I was like, okay, you know, don't know why, just a bit of anxiety. It, it's more of, it was excitement as much as anything else. But I do blush. I just, it happens to me just all the time. And it's always happened to me. And I don't really care, to be honest. I don't really care anymore. I mean, it's it's slightly annoying, but you know, what are you going to do? There's not really anything I can do about it, except doing the things that Matt suggested, which I've always tried to do. <sighs> Breathing, trying to uh, uh, take the right mindset, not taking not taking myself too seriously, um, you know. Um, but I've always lived with that, as I said, at school, but also as a teacher. And I remember I had a class of students once and we went to the pub afterwards and a couple of the girls um, in the class <laughs> came up to me and they told me that they, they, they were, one of them was Japanese, one of them was Korean, right? And they were like, oh, why do you blush so much? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. It's just, I don't know why it just happens to me. Maybe it's my complexion or something like that. I don't know. I find some people blush more easily than others. Anyway, I don't know. And, and I was like, oh yeah, it's a bit embarrassing. And they said, oh no, we found it really adorable. We found it really cute, which obviously made me blush as well. But they said to, they said to me, you know what? We, we actually kept trying to make you blush during lessons that uh, we would uh, ask you questions. <laughs> We'd ask you questions to try and make you blush and it would always work. So they would ask me, I don't know what, I can't remember what they would ask me about now, but they'd probably ask me some some personal question or something. <laughs> and then, they, then they'd have fun, fun watching me blush. But anyway, does that happen to you? Does it, does it happen to you at all? Do you ever kind of go a bit red in the face? And as I said before, the stupid thing about it is when you start to blush, you know that it's happening. You can feel you can feel your face warming up, and then that doesn't help because then you're like the fact that you're blushing makes you blush even more because you're like, oh god, I'm blushing, aren't I? Oh god, oh dear, I'm blushing again, and then that makes it worse. So, you know, I thought that I would say a few things about blushing just in case it happens to you too. Maybe this can help. And I actually, I asked. Microsoft Copilot for some suggestions. So this is another um, piece of generative AI software that's available. This is Microsoft Copilot, which actually uses ChatGPT4 or a version of ChatGPT4 to generate its responses. So you've got ChatGPT3, which is the free one, and ChatGPT4, which is a uh, you, which is one you pay for. And then there's a version of ChatGPT4 which is used for Microsoft Copilot. And you can just use Microsoft Copilot free. Just Google Microsoft Copilot or search Bing for Microsoft Copilot and you can just use it. It's, it's virtually the same as ChatGPT works in the same way. So I asked Copilot. And one of, one of the things I like about Microsoft Copilot is that it gives you um, uh, references for the information it's given you gives you a number of references at the bottom, website links, where it got the information it's presenting, which I like. I like the fact that it's giving you references. ChatGPT doesn't do that. So this is what I asked Copilot. Basically, I said, I can't remember the, the prompt. It was something like, can you suggest some, some uh, ways to deal with blushing in, in public? And this is what Copilot came up with. Blushing during public speaking can be quite common and sometimes distressing. However, there are strategies you can employ to manage it effectively. First of all, acceptance and perspective. Embrace blushing as a natural physiological response. Understand it happens to many people, even experienced speakers. So basically, it's just normal. It just means I'm a human being. So there you go, just in case you needed any uh, confirmation that I was a human and not some sort of super advanced AI powered <laughs> Android or some <laughs> or a kind of uh, AI generated English teacher. Not yet. That's not me yet. But of course, you know, the thing is about that is that 
in the future when AI, when generative AI is really advanced, it will it will do things like that. It'll when when I don't know how many years time this will be. Let's say in ten years time when you can just go on to you know teacher AI teacher dot com and where you've 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 got your your account and you've designed your own teacher so that they look a certain way they have a certain accent and they wear certain clothes and blah 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 they've you know when you've designed your teacher and you go into the your portal in your virtual classroom and you can just talk to your teacher and you've decided that you want it to look like Luke from Luke's English podcast and um <laughs> Maybe you even you've even included blush response. You've ticked the box that says blush response. I'm sure that AI eventually will will be able to do all these things, right? It'll it'll make its um, it'll make its uh, how how are we going to call them? Its avatars. It'll make its avatars as human as possible, I suppose, if we want them to be. And that no doubt will in in include some sort of blush simulator. <laughs> plug in for it anyway so it's a natural human response so there you go it just means i'm a human and next bit of advice um, is don't let it distract you if you're not bothered by your blushing the chances are the audience won't be either so i don't know if i'm doing that to be honest by talking about it um by addressing it directly does this this probably means that everyone's going to now think about it a lot more than they should and they'll be writing comments about it like they do about my beard which is kind of you know probably because i talk about it if i just never mentioned it people would probably wouldn't really talk about it that much but obviously i i i bring so much attention to it but anyway i've never talked about blushing before have i really it's never really much of a problem. It only seems to happen on the podcast in the evening, when I do podcasts in the evening. And when, when the sun has gone down and when I've got a light shining on me. So I have one of those, I can't show it because it's, it's, it's connected, but I've got one of those like, those LED bright white lights and it's a bit too bright. It like shines in my face and like reflects off my face and probably lights up my, it exacerbates any kind of facial blushing that happens at all. It's like really an oppressively bright light. Uh, it's not the most flattering light in the world. Um, so anyway, how did I end up talking about the light? I don't know, but that's one of the reasons. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens, yeah, in the evening, for some reason, if I do a podcast in the evening and I've got the bright light in my face, like, for example, when I spoke to Steve Kaufman, same exact thing happened. If you see that video, I'm all red in the face in that one as well. Maybe it's when I speak to older, experienced, <laughs> uh, well, well-known, experienced, older um, uh, gentlemen from... Uh, North America, <laughs> who have a reputation for uh, being sort of experts in their field related to communication. It's only in those situations that I blush. I don't know why. Um, now, when I spoke to Lucy from English with Lucy, I also blushed in that one because I was aware that, you know, this is English with Lucy with 10 million followers or whatever it is on YouTube. Oh, whoa. Anyway mindset shift this is the next thing that microsoft copilot came up with uh, avoid panic basically don't panic if you panic about blushing it might actually increase the amount of blushing which is easier said than done you know it's definitely easier said than done next thing is to normalize it okay just it's just normal remind yourself that blushing isn't a big deal it's just the the way your face reacts and it doesn't define your professionalism and, you know, again, this is another reason why I love audio content, because you just don't need to worry about all these peripheral, uh, un unimportant, uh, frankly, quite trivial details, which I have decided to spend ages talking about. Anyway, uh, what else? Focus on content. Remember that audiences care more about your message than the colour of your face. And I just want to remind some people in the comments section who this does not apply to, because there are some people out there who, for some reason, the, 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 the colour or um, condition of my face is the most important thing. Uh, for example, whether I have a beard or no, or no beard. That's not important. Don't worry about all that stuff, okay? Just let's focus on the things that are being said, not the, 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 the way the chin looks, where those things are coming from. 
Hmm? <laughs> um, <laughs> so focus on con content. Uh, other people see you from the outside and their attention is on what you're saying. The vast majority of the time. Humour and self-awareness. If you feel comfortable with the audience, playfully acknowledge your blushing. It can help ease nervousness and make it less noticeable. That's hopefully what I did in this uh, episode. Most people won't pay much attention to minor blushing. Um, breathing and relaxation. <sighs> Practice deep, slow breathing. It signals your brain to relax. This thing about breathing is actually a, a good one. And we know, don't we, that we have to breathe from our diaphragm, which is that sort of... Uh, large muscle inside under our lungs which goes down and expands when we take deep breaths and we have to breathe deeply sort of letting our stomach kind of expand that's when you get those deep breaths but i saw um matt abrahams mentioning breathing in another uh, episode of someone else's show or youtube video or something and he was saying that actually when when you're deep breathing the way to do it is to exhale Because once you, you start with the exhale, start with the exhale, which allows you to then take a deep breath. So that's a good thing to remember. You start with an exhale and then deep and then breathe in. But you know, to, to an extent, there's no escaping. Sometimes there's no escaping those moments when you feel a little bit um, nervous. I think the main thing is not to worry about it too much. You know, and if you need to kind of, Take a deep breath. You just take a deep breath. Everyone knows what it's like. It's fine. Um, regulate temperature. Uh, another bit of advice. Stay cool. Heat can trigger blushing. So dress in layers to adjust if needed. So basically, in the middle of your presentation, just whip your top off to reveal um, a little skimpy t-shirt. <laughs> that won't be embarrassing at all. Um, eye contact and makeup. Uh, maintain eye contact with your audience. It shifts focus away from your face. All right. And consider using makeup to minimize visible redness if it bothers you. I can't do that. I can't do that because I'd have to be an expert. I have to be an absolute expert at makeup to be able to uh, cover up my blushing. I think it would be obvious. Or just, you know, simply wear a mask, which is not. That's not constructive advice, Luke. Um, the main thing is, it's fine, don't worry about it. It happens to me, it happens to loads of people. If it happens to you too, welcome to the club, okay? You're, you're part of a, an illustrious, exclusive club of fellow human beings. And if you don't blush, how does public speaking or sort of social anxiety around speaking, how does it affect you? Leave your comments in the comments section, I'd love to know. How does that sort of situation affect you? What happens to you when you are put on the spot and you have to speak spontaneously, whether it's in English or in your native language? And all these responses are completely natural. Most people won't judge you based on it. We normally will judge ourselves a bit more harshly than others. And that's when the problems start, when we start to beat ourselves up or panic about it or judge ourselves too harshly. That's when things become a problem. Really, we need to just give ourselves a break and just focus on the message, focus on making the connection and just focus on the enthusiasm that you have for your subject. Okay. You can find some links and stuff. Uh, that A lot of that information will be on the page for this episode on my website, including summaries of the things that Matt Abrams was talking about, links to his podcast, which is very interesting indeed. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I really like about Matt Abrams' stuff is that it's all based on research. It's based on academic research. So there's real substance to the things that he says and the advice he gives. And in, in episodes of his podcast, he talks to um, academics from different fields, um, you know, like neurologists and all, all sorts of other people. He talks to them and draws conclusions from the th their findings um, in order to make more comments and give more tips about a successful communication. Very interesting to listen to him. So you'll find links to his podcast, a link to his book, uh, which is called Think Faster, Talk Smarter. 
That's the book. And Think Fast, Talk Smart is the podcast as well. And you'll also find a link to his Stanford uh, Graduate Business School presentation, which is the one that's got 34 million views and the one where he only goes uh, once for a split second. I'm, I'm sure he does it more than that. Actually, on that subject, it's impressive that he can do that. But I should say that I think that that presentation, and in fact, a lot of the things, frankly, that he says in this episode, I think those are things he said lots and lots of times before. If you think about it, it's stuff that he knows incredibly well. He's written a book on the subject. He's done like many, many different presentations and interviews where he's given the same points. So he's very, very well practiced at giving those points. And when I asked him about something outside of that, he did, to be fair, uh, make some of those little noises like um and uh noises, you know, because that's just a normal feature of spontaneous speech. And when you look at, for example, you know, those keynote speeches by Steve Jobs or TED Talks, those are not very realistic or fair representations of spoken English. Okay, and those sorts of things do set a slightly unrealistic precedent for what natural spontaneous speech is. Because like Steve Jobs doing a presentation, that is not spontaneous speech. He has he he, he prepared those presentations uh, down to the minute detail and did them again and again and again. Okay. Um, and that's how he was able to deliver that information so smoothly, so, so flawlessly. And it's true for the, the people who do TED Talks and those other big high-profile high presentations. They don't go um and uh because they have practiced and practiced and practiced those presentations again and again. Same thing is true for stand-up comedy specials. When you see Ricky Gervais on Netflix and it looks like it's all spontaneous, it looks like he's just giving a sort of stream of consciousness monologue, being naturally funny with a joke every 10, 10 seconds. But he's done that show, he's done that hour or that two hour show again and again and again in different cities, in different countries, again and again and again before filming it. Plus the, the, the video is edited. Those TED Talk videos are edited as well to clean them up, to, to make them as sort of perfect as possible. So don't judge yourself too harshly and don't use those sorts of standards. Uh, don't set that kind of standard for yourself uh, when it comes to just speaking in a more uh, spontaneous way. And also realise the the value of, of preparation and practice and how that how much that can help. Okay, I'm going to end the episode now. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for watching, everybody. Have a lovely day, afternoon, morning, evening, night, and I will speak to you again on this podcast soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye.